Okay, so uh, now we have the rabbinic literature. Okay, so we look at the Targum Jonathan. And the Targum Jonathan is a rabbinic interpretation of the book of Isaiah. And so this is an important thing to look at, to see the Aramaic translation of Isaiah. And the Aramaic translation for chapter 4 says the following. Okay, and it says... Uh, and in that time, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, Of that which is ours we will eat, and of that which is ours we will cover ourselves. Only let us be called by thy name, and take away our reproach. And at that time shall the Mashiach, the Messiah of the Lord, be for joy and for glory to those that are escaped. And those that keep the law shall be for greatness and for praise. And it shall come to pass that he shall return to Zion, and he that is doing the law shall be established in Jerusalem, and he shall be called holy. Every one that is written for eternal life. Okay? And you note that that is a Torah concept from Parashat Kitisa, right? And, um, and then they shall see the consolation of Jerusalem. When the Lord shall have put away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and remember this word in, in Isaiah's text was the excrement, literally the, the poop. Right, it's so awful that um, their 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 filth, their sin, is his excrement. Right, and that the Lord will put away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and when He shall have removed from her midst those that are shedding the innocent blood, and those who are murderers, and which is in Jerusalem, in the word of judgment and by the word of consummation, the Lord will create upon every holy hill or every holy place of the mountain of Zion, and upon the place of the house of His Shekinah, um, the house the house of his glory, right? A cloud of glory, which shall be shouting over it by day and a thick cloud and a brightness as of flaming fire by night. Okay, and again, this is another Torah example that draws us back to Torah, right? And because of the excellency of the glory which he has promised to bring upon it, the Shekinah shall be protecting it with a protection. And, and over Jerusalem shall be a tabernacle of clouds to shadow it by day. And... Um, from the scorching heat, from a place of refuge, um, from storm and from rain. Okay. So, so here we read Isaiah chapter 4. And the Targum Jonathan, Isaiah 4, opens, or it states, it says that at this time shall Messiah, shall the Messiah of the Lord be for joy and for glory to those that are escaped and those that keep up the law shall be for greatness and for praise. And it shall come to pass that he that shall return to Zion, he that is doing the law shall be established in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and he shall be called holy. Everyone that is written for eternal life shall see the consolation of Jerusalem. So um, we read, we're reading, um, I'm just going to circle this because I think it's important. Um, Isaiah 4, 1 through 3, okay, in the Targum. And the, you know, here the rabbinic expectation of the Messiah in the midst of the troubles of Israel. Okay, so Jewish history is filled with the anticipation of the coming of the Messiah. You know, these things such as the Aramaic translation of the Nevi'im, the prophets, speak to us as evidence for, um, from a pre-Christian context, right? You know, the Talmud, Megillah, 3a, attributes the Targum author, authorship to um, Jonathan ben Uziel, the pupil of Hillel the Elder, right? And according to this source, it was composed by Jonathan ben Uziel from the mouths of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, these prophets, implying that this, this, this translation of Isaiah is right from the mouth of these prophets and then from the, based on the traditions that's derived from the last prophets placing the, this, this translation of the Targum into antiquity, right? And both biblical and apocryphal writings, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, near the turn of the century, you know, led to a remarkable increase in messianic expectation. And this is likely due to the Roman oppression of the time. And this may be, or may have been in preparation for the emergence of God's Messiah, Yeshua, a young rabbi from Nazareth, his teachings and prophetic insights, miracles, and working in the power of God stirred the crowd with much messianic fervor. 
and provoked his enemies to put him to death. And we read that in John chapter 11, verses 45 to 53. Now, in addition to this, Josephus also makes a record of Yeshua being the Messiah in the context of the period of the millennium being ushered in. You know, the point is that the Targum translation here that we're, we're looking at provides us with an expectation of the Messiah, which was also coupled to the obedience of God's people to the Torah of God and having one's name written in God's book of life. You know, this, this is what we're seeing right here in this very, uh, the very first three verses of the Targum translation on Isaiah. Isn't that fascinating? And the fact that when we go back and we look at Isaiah chapter 4, you know, we look at what we had just talked about concerning the Tzemach, right? The, this righteous branch, this branch that God is going to rise up from the midst of his, um, his vineyard, right? That it is a messianic expectation. Um, chapter 4, verse 1 of Isaiah is the very first um, occurrence of a messianic expectation that, that ties us into all of Scripture and as Isaiah continues into the remainder of his, his text. So um, now Ezra, he, he states the following concerning Isaiah 4, verse 2. Okay, so we look at Ezra, Ibn Ezra. Now Isaiah 4, 2 in the Targum, it says that in that day shall the branch of the Lord... No, this is Isaiah. Um, this is not the Targum. So in, in that day... The, the, in that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. Okay, so Ibn Ezra here says that uh, the, the branch of the Lord refers to, some refer to this, uh, to this Hezekiah. I think it signifies the righteous portions of the inhabitants of Jerusalem that will be saved. Okay, so... Ibn Ezra believes that the branch of the Lord is a reference to Hezekiah, you know, the righteous, the righteous king. And um, remember that Hezekiah was the son of a godless father, right, of um, King Ahaz. And we read this in 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 2 through 4. Yet we're told that Hezekiah did right in the sight of the Lord, according to 2 Kings 18, verse 3. So this shows Hezekiah's strength and resolved to forsake the way of his father and to walk in the way of God. You know, so Hezekiah removed the pagan altars and the idols and the temples were destroyed. You know, the bronze serpent that Moshe had made in the desert was worshipped by the people and he was also destroyed here by Hezekiah because the people had made it into an idol according to 2 Kings 18 verse 4. So the temple in Jerusalem, whose doors had been nailed shut by Hezekiah's own father, was cleaned up and reopened, and the Levitical priesthood was reinstated according to Second Chronicles 29, verse 5. And the Passover was reinstituted as a national day according to Second Chronicles 30, verse 1. So it's not surprising that Ibn Ezra considers Hezekiah this branch of God as returning the people to righteousness, the righteousness of God. Okay, so Targum Jonathan continues... And he says in his translation in verse 3, it says, And it shall come to pass that he shall return to Zion, and he that is doing the law shall be established in Jerusalem. He shall be called holy. Everyone that is written for eternal life shall see the consolation of Jerusalem. Okay, so Jonathan interprets the one who returns as the one who loves the Lord and walks in his commandments and has his name written in the book of eternal life, right? And it's interesting how I thought how um, a vote... D. Rabbi Natan, 34, part 11, states uh, concerning these things. You know, so let's read, let's read through that. So he says, Ten entities are considered truly alive. Okay? So one is the Holy One blessed, the Holy One blessed be, I'm sorry, okay, the Holy Blessed One. As it says in Jeremiah 10, verse 10, the eternal is truly God. He is a living God. And in number two, um, the Torah is called a living Torah, as it says in Proverbs, is a tree of life for those who hold fast to it and all its supporters are happy. Um, number three, Isaiah, Israel are called alive. And it says in Deuteronomy 4, and you who cling to the eternal, your God, you are all alive today. And then number four, a righteous person is called life, as it says in Proverbs, the fruit 
of the righteous is the tree of life. And then five, the Garden of Eden is called living. As it says in Psalm 116, verse 9, I will walk before the eternal in the land of the living. And in part six, one of the trees of the garden is called the tree of life. As it says in Genesis 2, 9, and the tree of life in the midst of the garden. And in part, and number seven is the land of Israel is called the land of the living. As it says in Ezekiel, it will place ra radiance in the land of the living. Jerusalem is called living, as it is says in Psalm 116, verse 9. I will walk before the eternal in the land of the living. And then eight, acts of kindness are eternal life, as it says in Psalm 63, verse 4. For your kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. And then nine, a wise person is called life, as it says in Proverbs. The Torah of the wise is a source of life. And then in ten, remember these are the ten entities that are considered truly alive and that, that water is called living as it says in Zechariah 14.8 on that day living waters will come forth from Jerusalem. Okay so we notice how this how significant this commentary is concerning the Torah as the author states that there are ten things that are considered for one to be truly alive and the way the rabbis describe these things is, is I thought it was quite remarkable in the sense that the rabbis always place a positive twist to the Torah command. And as history bears out, what happens when God's people forsake his holy instructions for life? You know, the New Testament text tells us that the Torah is holy and righteous and good, according to Paul in Romans 7, verse 12. But those seeking righteousness based upon the Torah's requirement will dis discover the tragic fact that the Torah is powerless to impart righteousness and life. You know, that without God's help, leading and empowering through his spirit and presence in our lives the righteousness of god is um given through faith and the righteousness will the righteous will live by their faith to obey god's word we note how these things are connected to the messianic expectation of the messiah who is sent from god to save his people remember that it is from the beginning of scripture to the end of scripture it always is first by faith that leads to these other things right it's always by faith this is the way it's always been. We're not, we don't find this idea that man is earning his salvation in, um, in order not to die, you know, or to get into heaven. You know, we, we, don't, we don't find that in, in the scriptures. We're, we find that it always leads by faith. And we have to have faith in the Lord God who is calling us, right, and in Yeshua, his Messiah. Now, the next reference is to uh, the Talmud. And the Talmud states the following concerning Isaiah 4 verse 2. So it says, with regard to the righteous, this is as we have just said, with regard to the Messiah, it is written, and this is his name, whereby ye shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Okay, with, with regard to Jerusalem, this is what is written, it shall be 18,000 reeds around about, and the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is their Shema. Do not read the word as their Shema, rather read it as the Lord is its name, Shema. Rabbi Eliezer says in the future the righteous will have the name holy recited before them as the one recites before the Holy One. Blessed be he, as it is stated, and it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and he who remains in Jerusalem shall be called holy. Okay, and then, um, so we find that uh, they're quoting from Isaiah 4.3. That's why that... Uh, we're looking at this Talmud section. Here, here the rabbis speak of these verses again in regards to the Messiah and the city. In, in, in Jer Jeremiah 23, verse 6, says, This is the name whereby you shall, he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. And we looked at this, right? I, Jeremiah 23, verse 6. They're referring to the one whom God sends, speaking of the righteousness of God that is in the Messiah. And the Talmud speaks of the redemption that is brought by the hand of the Messiah through the name of God, through Hashem tying this to what we read in Isaiah 4 3 and those who return and or who remain will be called holy you know something I thought was interesting about this is that the the Talmud is using the very same text the proof text for the Messiah that we see in in the New Testament right in the New Testament account now uh, Paul he he said the following thing um the in the context of uh, Paul in the New Testament we, we find the following now Paul wrote in Romans 4 verses 1 through 8 um, let me scroll down a little bit here okay so he says 
What shall we say that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? If Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereby the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So again, we see here that faith is leading, right? And then, um, now to him that worketh is a reward, and not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believe on him that justified the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteous, righteousness without works. Okay saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. Okay, so what's interesting about this particular aspect of the text is of what Paul is saying is that it is by faith that we are counted righteous, not by works, not by obeying Torah, right? The point is that because it is by faith doesn't mean that we are not to live by God's word, that we are not to... Um, we're not to obey, you know, and that, that's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying that we are righteous by faith and that our works fall short of what God expects. So we believe by faith and we, we seek the Lord and we seek to live our lives for him, right? And we do so according to his word and we do so by obeying his Torah, right? And um, Paul um, okay, well, let's go on. There were a couple other verses. Oops, a couple other verses here. Um, Galatians 2.16, it says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no man be justified. And then, um, and then, we see here in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, it says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and not, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, right? and not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, so we note that what Paul seems to be saying, the typical interpretation is that man earned his salvation by seeking righteousness and justification before God through the Torah. You know, but now we receive this righteousness by the free gift of the Messiah, righteousness imputed to us through our faith and trust in Him. The, this is what the theologies today teach. Okay, so the truth of the matter is that man did not earn his salvation, but has always trusted in God for the forgiveness of sins according to the Scriptures. You know, the Scriptures say, uh, they, they speak of the righteousness of God by faith and our living out our faith in our lives as well. And the New Testament text speaks of abiding in the Messiah and of the power of God in our lives by His presence through the Holy Spirit in our lives to overcome sin. The very nature of sin itself, based upon the Scriptures, is to obey God's commands. We note that the call to walk according to the Spirit is given to us throughout the Scriptures. In the Torah, it is by the way of the circumcised heart, you know, something only God can do. And in the New Testament, it is by the presence of God through the indwelling of His Holy Spirit. You know, to walk in the Spirit, one is not sinning, meaning that one is obeying God's Word, walking in obedience and not disobedience. You know, all of these concepts must be brought into context in order to understand what Paul is saying here. Even though we are not able to be perfect in our lives, we occasionally sin, and this does not mean that we are to just disregard God's commands. Right? And the, the faith that we have in the Messiah and the righteousness of Yeshua in our lives this does not mean that we no longer are expected to walk in truth and righteousness and holiness and justice before God and before men. You know, this is the point of Avot the Rabbi Natan, 34, part 11, that speaks of the Torah and the ten things that are considered to be one uh, for to be truly alive. You know, these things are also consistent with what Isaiah is saying here in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 4. And in verse 4, he says that uh, when the Lord shall have put away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and when he shall have removed from her midst those that are shedding innocent blood, which is in Jerusalem, by the word of judgment and the word of consummation. We notice how it is the Lord God Almighty who is putting away this filth, right? The, the Lord is the one who is at work, right? The, this is the work of God and not 
as the modern theologies are claiming that man earned his salvation and righteousness and right standing before God in the Old Testament. I mean, that, that's just a flat-out falsity, right? And in, it's, it's a, a very poor scholarship and understanding of the Scriptures. Now, notice how inconsistent this theology is, um, really is, you know, when we think about that and we study it. Now, Rashi agrees when he says the following, and, and Rashi says um, in on Isaiah 4, 4, part 2, he says, filth and defilement, it, it, as its Aramaic translation is to say, when he will remove their iniquity, iniquity through chastening and purging from the world. Okay, so Rashi states that this filth, the sin of the people through idolatry, pride, and sexual sin, sin their iniquity is removed through chastening and purging from the world. Their, their sins have led to their death. And note how this is consistent with what Paul taught according to 1 Corinthians 11, verses 30-31, when he said, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we judge ourselves, if we ju would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And note this Greek word, koi, koi muo, muontai, koi muontai, um, literally means to sleep, which is an expression meaning that one is dead or has died. You know, so I, that um, this, this whole concept of, uh, of unrepentance and of, of unfaithfulness before God is, applies to us today, you know, those who believe in Yeshua. Now, um, we go on in Isaiah chapter 4, verses 5 through 6 in Targum, it says, And the Lord will create upon every holy place of the mountain of Zion, upon the place of the house of, of his Shekinah, a, glory, a cloud of glory, which shall be overshadowing it by day, and a thick cloud and a brightness as a flaming fire by night, because of the excellency of the glory which he has promised to bring upon it. The Shekinah shall be protecting it with a protection, and over Jerusalem shall be a tabernacle of clouds to overshadow it by day from the scorching heat and from a place of refuge, for a place of refuge from the storm and from the rain. So, Jonathan interprets Isaiah's words to describe the Shekinah glory of God overshadowing the mountain of God and those who abide therein. And so the Talmud describes this follow in the following way. So we look at the Talmud uh, 75b in part 2. It says, the Gemara, the Gemara returns to the aforementioned verse, and the Lord will create over the whole habitation of Mount Zion and over those who are invited to it a cloud and a smoke by day, which is the meaning, what is the meaning of the phrase, and those who are invited to it? Rabbah says that, that Rabbi Yohanan says, Jerusalem of the world to come is not like Jerusalem of this world. With regard to Jerusalem of, the, of this world, anyone who wants to ascend there can ascend. With regard to Jerusalem of the world to come, only those who are invited to it can ascend. Now that's just an interesting, important point, right? And then the next is the Talmud Bava Batra 75a, part 14. This is Rabbah says that Rabbi Yochanan says in the future, the Holy One, blessed be He, will fashion seven canopies for each and every righteous individual, as it states, and the Lord will create over the whole habitation of Mount Zion and over those who are invited to it a cloud and a smoke by day and a shining of flame, flaming fire by night, for over all the glory shall be a canopy. And this teaches us that each and every righteous individual, right, each and every righteous individual, the Holy One, blessed be He, fashions for Him a canopy seven times over in accordance with His honor, Greater individuals receive grander and larger canopies. Okay, so the rabbis, they draw out a good point. You know, that we are invited to the olam haba, to the world to come, in, into heaven, right? And in the case of the temple in Jerusalem, one may ascend on one's own. You know, whereas to enter into heaven, one is invited. This is by invitation only. And we note how this invitation, interpretation is consistent with the idea that, um, that man doesn't earn his way into heaven, right? So again, we, we even see a rabbinic proof text for this very same concept. You know, the man does not earn his way into heaven. The ancient understanding of the Torah was and remains a function of the covenant relationship, right? The Torah was given to people who are in covenant relationship with God, having been given instructions on how to live when we literally have the presence of God dwelling in our midst. Notice the picture that is being put together here regarding faith and faithfulness. Now, um, we go... Now, oh, okay. So, um, this, this concludes part three... Um, of the, the rabbinic commentary. 
So uh, let me, we'll go on to part four, and then this is the last part for the study for tonight. And...